Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you everyone for joining. We get, we get started in a few seconds. We have a few folks that are being admitted from the waiting room. But I wanna thank every, each and one of, one of you for joining us today for our session on capital gains tax. This is such a exciting topic, right guys? <laughs> Been a lot of banter on this issue for, I mean, this has started over a year now. And um, we felt it very necessary to have a seminar on this. So we're very excited. We have a, a, f a phenomenal panel of experts on the subject matter that's gonna give some information on the topic. I would advise you as you join, just please, please, please put yourself on mute. Um, if you wanna mute as, as you join, uh, we're in a meeting format here. Uh, what you wanna do though, any questions you have throughout the program, you wanna enter it in the chat. And um, if we have a nice clean seminar, a nice clean call, maybe you can even come off mute and ask your question directly to the panel. But as we kick things off here, um, please um, you know, put yourself on mute um, so we don't disrupt the rest of the programming. So uh, my name is Kyle Griffith. I am the managing partner at NYBB Group. And we haven't put it on these seminars ever since the pandemic. We did a, a couple of different topics last year. And uh, we've been, a lot of our clients had reached out to us that wanted to get some information on um, capital gains and how it affects uh, the potential sale of their business, um, you know, the, what taxes they potentially pay with the proposed Biden plan. So this topic has, you know, been long overdue. Um, however, we have we put it together for you guys today. We have a great panel that's, that we have put together um, to, to discuss the subject matter. Uh, we feel it's a very timely, timely topic and we hope that you um, get something away from this that you can uh, uh, can learn if we wanted this is more of an educational um, session you want to obviously take any tax advice from your from your your, 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 your tax from your CPA um, so as I said I'm Kyle Griffith I've been in this business for for 10 plus years I have two other partners that are members of my firm um, and we have been serving the business community um, providing assistance in mergers and acquisitions for the past 18 years um, enough about me um, you guys are here to hear from the experts uh, we have three um, experts on, on the subject matter. Um, first, we have Matthew Rappaport, and it's allowed me to introduce our three panels, and I'll have them, you know, fill in where I left off, because I'm sure they can tell their stories way better than I can. Uh, many of you probably know Matthew, and if you haven't, you get to know him now. I mean, he's a, an expert on taxation as it relates to real estate, closely held businesses, private equity funds, trusts and estates. He provides different services, including tax planning, structuring, and compliance for commercial real estate projects. And he's known for his work on complex deals. He knows his stuff. He's been doing this for a long time and he's an expert on the subject matter. Um, next up we have is Tony Tomorrow. Um, he is a partner with Grassy CPA, which is one of the top CPA firms in Long Island. Um, he services, he's a partner in the firm and he consults with businesses uh, that are looking to plan an exit strategy. Um, he's also a CPA and he specializes in guiding clients through merger and acquisition transactions and providing advisory services to both buyers and sellers. So, so Tony is going to give his insights and ex his expertise on deal, uh, on the deal due volume that he has seen from Grassy. Um, and he has been in the private equity space for a while before joining, X, joining Grassy, so he has a wealth of experience in the space. And um, anchoring our team here, uh, who I'm excited to hear from, is the man himself, Mr. Robert Tube. Um, and Tube guides his clients through the complexities of tax planning and compliance on the federal, state, and international levels. He specializes in helping pass through entities multi-state corporations, high net worth individuals, investors, so on and so on. He advises clients in a wide range of industries. And many of you here are business owners from different um, industries and some of you are advisors and, and of, of, of business owners. Our, our goal here today is to give you some indication of what we are seeing and what the panelists are seeing, help you understand what what exactly is capital gains? And we're going to discuss that. We're not going to assume that everyone is know what it is and how businesses are taxed. And we're going to discuss deal volume, what's happening in the market. Um, 
you know, how to avoid and how to prepare for a potential event where you're selling your company and the tax rate is proposed to go up. So that's essentially our framework for today, guys. I wanna, I'm gonna kill this, 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 this slideshow for now. And um, Matt, my friend, you wanna introduce yourself because um, in case I miss anything, you wanna give everyone a quick overview of yourself and, you, and your company. You have a great team with, with Jeffrey. I mean, you guys are building a rock star law practice there. I mean, you guys are kicking butt. That's, so, um, that's, I'm, I'm, that's, that's good news. Although I'll tell you, uh, you did say I've been doing this for a long time. That's because I don't know if you guys knew this. They just make you a lawyer right out of high school. And that's how I've been doing this for such a long time because they can just hand you a degree like that. I'll tell you the secret, but you have to pay me a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> well, but thankfully, other, this is, other than that, but, you did a pretty good job. Hey, I mean, look, that, thankfully, this is yeah. free. This is free. So no one's being charged. So we, we want all the secrets <laughs> here now. The firm, <laughs> the firm <laughs> however, uh, yeah, we've we've the firm. We formed the firm three years ago. I merged with Jeff. I merged with Ken Falcon. I don't know if everybody knows Ken Falcon, but I, it was me. It was Jeff, Ken Falcon, and then Michelle Schlereth came to the dark side of the forest. I beckoned her to the dark side of the forest. Michelle was uh, at a principal at Baker Tilly. And then she got her law degree at night and we kind of uh, beckoned her over and uh, she made the plunge with us. So, uh, so it was the four of us, we all merged and um, it's, it's just been crazy. I mean, it's, you know, Jeff is, is the M&A lawyer with us. You know, so that's it. Jeff has a relationship with you, of course. And, you know, for me, I supplement his practice because Jeff previously never had access to all the ancillary practice areas. Like every time real estate would come up or tax would come up or intellectual property would come up or something, you'd have to like start corralling like other lawyers from different firms. Now it's all under one roof, which is pretty cool. So, um, you know, but you cover my practice uh, very well. You know, it's, um, it, it's a pretty simple thing at the end of the day. It's tax planning and structuring income estate and gift tax. Um, you know, and I, I cover, I try to cover a lot of stuff which is really tough to keep in your head, but um, primarily it's, it's real estate, private equity, tech, um, and, and planning for, for M&A. So that's me. Matt, for, for you, it's simple. For us, tax is complicated. That's why you have to hire good folks like you. So. Yeah, thankfully, because otherwise <laughs> I'd never be able to pay my student loans. <laughs> well, Matt, it's a pleasure. I know this is going to be a, a, a very good session. I can tell you that much. So Matt, appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next up we have is Tony tomorrow. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Kyle. It's, uh, it's hard to follow, you know, Matt's uh, humor after that one. I, uh, I try not to be as dry as uh, being a CPA, but uh, I, I've, uh, as you can see from my gray hair, I've been around much longer than Matt. Um, been in a private uh, space, uh, CFO of public company. I worked for a private equity group uh, and then uh, bounced back into the public arena and uh, fortunate to jo join Grassi about almost seven years ago. Uh, so I do run the consulting practice here, which covers a lot of different services, but the, the, the place I spend most of my time with nowadays is the mergers and acquisition uh, side of the practice. So we represent clients from a buy side or the sell side, depending what their wishes are. Uh, I have a talented team of about 20 people that uh, run all different uh, facets of services, whether it's forensic accounting, business valuations, uh, we do some uh, cyber, uh, we do uh, operational assessments. So I get to I get to go into a company and say, what's what's your where are your pain points and how how do we fix them for you? So that's sort of a little bit about the firm where as a uh, I'll kindly said with a top firm in Long Island that we appreciate that we've uh, we just reached over 420 plus people in our firm with six offices so we're 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 growing uh, I'm fortunate to be joined by my partner Robert Toby he's the expert on the tax so any questions that you have on taxes go to him uh, I can tell you about everything else but uh, I'm happy to be here thank you Thanks. I think you and I are the outliers here, Tony. We are, we are the deal makers, right? Let's, let's leave the conversation to yeah. the, tax, the tax specialist, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> hey, Tony, it's, it's, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad we became acquainted and um, it's a pleasure to have Robert here, you know, kind of sharing with us his insight. I, I think between Robert and Matt, we have a, we are for a real, we do well-rounded panel here. So I'm excited to hear what you guys have to share today. So Robert, you're next up, my friend. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm Robert Toby. I, I do have a CPA license, but I'm the least CPA-ish person you'll ever meet in the planet. Um, I'm a fortunate and grateful guy that I find something I'm good at and like to do. Uh, I like to work with my clients. I like to work with the tax law. Uh, my goal is to understand it sufficiently that 
uh, I don't explain it to you in jargon. I explain it to you in English so you understand it and you can um, make good decisions with respect to your business. Uh, for, see, for someone in my profession, I have a unique background. Uh, I haven't always been in public practice. I've owned my own businesses at times. Um, uh, for a while, I was uh, associated, well, for, for a while, 26 years, I was associated with the University of Virginia, um, not necessarily on faculty, but is working with um, their licensing and ventures group and some other inventors to uh, commercialize uh, some of their inventions and some of them we've done so very successfully. One of them uh, recently became public. Uh, others have been sold um, and, and are still private and, and, and uh, had other types of exits. But I've, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of business owners from, from literally the from, from uh, conception of an idea uh, through uh, the growth of the idea to uh, monetization to uh, growing their business and finally to exiting it. And, and I got to tell you, it's one of the favorite parts of my business, because if you do this right, you can get some really great economic answers uh, and get some tax efficiencies out of the deal. Kyle, you're muted. Hey, Rob, you see you spoke and you just muted me out. You see the effect that you have? That's a power you have here, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's just get into our subject matter. I mean, so we're not going to assume everyone understands what capital gains tax is. Um, so let's just jump into it. You know, what is capital gains tax and why should business owners that are planning a, a sale in, in the near future care? Just, if you guess, uh, someone could give us a, a definition of what is capital gains tax. Yeah, we can get into it's, the it's the gain on certain sale of, 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 of assets that are specified by the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, inventory is not one of them. Um, you know, it can be it can be land held for investment is subject to capital gains. It can be stocks and bonds that we all know that I think that most of us are aware of. It can be certain gains on the sales of businesses. It can be certain gains on other types of assets, and they're taxed at a preferential rate. Uh, the rate currently, the maximum is twenty eight at twenty three point eight percent on on certain types of uh, of assets. Uh, certain types of business. Um, structures when you sell the assets are not subject to the, the extra 3.8% Medicare tax and are only taxed at 20%, but it's really a preferential tax rate on certain specified types of assets. That's the best way I can describe it. Okay, per perfect. I, I couldn't say it better myself, Rob. Definitely. So the proposed rate is going to go up, it's going to double, right? Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit more about that? Give some reason to, I mean, you don't have to get into the specifics of why, but from your perspective, discuss how that's going to affect uh, a potential business. That's oh, it's, it, it's, it's one of those, it depends questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, first off, I want to say is, you know, everybody take a deep breath and take a step back from the edge. Because, you know, frankly, it's something that we can all talk about and plan for. But I will tell you, there's not even a, a text of a bill yet with, with this proposal in it. Um, I serve on a couple of AICPA committees and, and uh, taxation committees, and there's no write-up. So with, without a text of a bill, without a write-up, without having a go to committee, without having it being passed and signed into law, you got nothing. You still got the same tax rate. But mm -hmm. is it something that we want to consider and plan for? Yeah. The rate is, is proposed by President Biden to double. So it would double to the, to the rate of 40% to, from 20 to 40% on incomes over a million dollars. The question is, what is income over a million dollars? Is it adjusted gross income? Is it modified adjusted gross income? Is it taxable income? So that's the first thing that needs to be answered. Who will it go up on and what is a million dollars? Secondly, it's proposed to go into effect on April, effectively May 1st, you know, any, any transactions happening after uh, April 30th, 2020 would be subject to this. So it, it, it may have an effect on a deal that's under consideration right now, or it's going through negotiation, or, or it's going to be closed. Um, so that's where the effect is. And cu this coupled in, an, in one point that, that we didn't put on here that, that we need to talk about is also the raise in New Jersey's and New York's personal income tax rate that will have an effect on incomes over, I believe it's a million dollars too, that are going to really have a huge effect on folks with certain levels of income selling their assets. 
The New York the New York change is already in effect, so we already have to take uh, aware of that. But the federal change is proposed to go into effect on on uh, on April 30th, and I will bet Tony tomorrow's car that that won't happen. Which, which, which car? <laughs> the car he's currently Prius, driving. I hope. <laughs> The Telesona Rolls yeah, Royce. I'll, I'll bet it's Prius. The Prius, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, here, here's, a, here's the thing. We just came out of a pandemic. We are on, on the back end of it. And the, the biggest concern was, are we going to get back to normal as far as business goes, right? That was the biggest topic leading into last year. But in the back of people's minds, this whole tax potential increase was on, was looming, right? It was, but now we are in, 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 in the thick of things, right? So I have, I have clients that are just concerned about that. Those are that, hey, I need to get a deal done this year. Or if I don't, what what's going to happen? So let's just jump right into it. Um, we're going to be an open format, right? We're not going to go too much in depth into PowerPoints, but some folks are visual. I'm going to put some questions up that we have prepared for the panel here. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. So bear me for a second while I'm uh, bring back. Oh, while you're getting that up, I just want to comment. You talked sure. about, oh, people are wondering when we're going to go back to normal. Nothing's been normal. All right. I did a deal four <laughs> years ago, okay, for a medical client on a sell side. I represent, I was doing tax structuring on the sell side. There's a medical client had a good multi location medical practice. I will not give any more specifics because oh. you'll be able to identify it. Double digit EBITDA multiple four years ago. Okay. And I looked at that and I turned to client, client turns to me and goes, you think I'm getting a good deal? I'm like, buddy, get it while well, the getting's good. Are you serious? You get double digit EBITDA multiple in a medical practice? It was nuts. And I was sitting there scratching my head and I'm just like, how does private equity, which was purchasing it, plan on making up a double digit EBITDA multiple on a medical practice? I'll leave private equity to figure that out. That's for minds that are, are more educated and intelligent than me. But I just looked at the client and I said, I don't know, is it possible for you to get a better deal? I mean, maybe in fantasy land. I mean, this is like, and that was four years ago. And it's only gotten crazier since then. It's only gotten more nuts. The, everything is nuts. The stock market, publicly traded securities is nuts. Private transactions are nuts. Real estate transactions are nuts. Everything's nuts. I mean, and, and then the pandemic came and then there was Fed funny money and now it's just out of control. So like you could go back to normal. It's like, oh, we walk around the office. We go into an office building without wearing a mask and sit next to our colleagues and look at them across the desk. I mean, that's fine. But in terms of the M&A environment and in terms of transactions, everything is, is crazy. And, and that that's like, you know, like normal, like what is normal? I don't know. It depends. I mean, if you want to talk about like uh, being vaccinated and walking around an office building, I mean, great. But the, the M&A environment, I think has a long way to go before it gets to anything that we're used to. I mean, cause no, nobody's used to this. Am I right about this, uh, Bob and, and Tony? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Go ahead, Tony. You said it better. No, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that concerns me is the bandwidth, you know, can we, can we keep up with these deals, right? The, just from a, even from a service provider perspective, there's so many deals going on right now. And, and you know, listen, pe people are looking at these capital gains, uh, you know, they're around the corner, right? Um, some of them may be on a fence. Uh, they, they were on a fence about selling. I, now I think they're jumping. They're, they're, they wanna get, they want to get a deal done, right? Uh, and the ones that don't want to do a deal, and, and Rob could talk about some of their options, uh, you know, they may, they may just say, we're gonna, have some other we have some other options that we can take and not deal with the capital gains right now so we'll we'll get into that a little bit later on but uh you're you're, you're right on point matt tony yeah, your bandwidth matt, point yeah, is matt, excellent matt, rob you jump in but you're yeah, tony, yeah, matt, i just want to say your bandwidth tony, point two, is yeah, two points this is you know and this is where this is where all three of us can do that you know sometimes people are being offered so much money and they want to sell their business so badly they do it that way and, 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 and all of us have experienced that where, you know, you, you, you get someone says, yeah, this guy came in the private equity group. They offered me 15 times. I got to sell this thing right away. And they don't stop and think. They don't stop and think of, of, of they're looking at the purchase price. They're saying, I'm selling my business. This is what I'm getting for it. But they don't realize that this money is going to have to last them in some cases, if they're in their forties, it's going to have to last them 40 or 50 years and how to tax structure this deal and value the business for us uh, for gift pack tax purposes and other transfers prior to signing that letter of intent and getting, and getting not only the money out of it, but making a $60 million deal look like an $80 million deal because he did really great structuring with it. 
And what I've seen, and Tony and, and Matt, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you say, is sometimes I've seen deals done, in, in, and I'm working with a deal right now. The, it, the guy's doing it in the silliest ass way in the world. He got a term sheet. He thought it was the greatest thing in the whole wide world. And now we're scrambling to find ways how to make it work. Tony, you go first. No, no, you go, Matt. You, you get, you're, you're more uh, animated than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was – look, I was, I was going to say not only do people fail to, to consider the tax structuring aspects of it, they're not going to, to Grassi and company beforehand and saying, how do my books look? Like it's, you know, I built this business and, and, and I'm going to go show all the books to some sophisticated private equity shop that may be advised by getting uh, killed on their bills by big four. And, <laughs> and, you know, here I am having big four crawl all over this thing in every nook and cranny. And am I even prepared to have private equity look at this thing? And then if I don't even mention from the legal side, it's terms of like, I, did I evaluate what all my agreements are, not only internally, you know, whether it's with the people that work for me and with me, it's, it might also be the, the contracts that I've executed with outside vendors and with clients and with all these other people. Am I prepared to have eyes on all that stuff? So your point, Rob, is great. Oh, I haven't even gone in and, and figured out whether or not this is uh, tax structuring wise, whether this is even good for me. They haven't even gone in and examined their books and records and their legal due diligence and been like, hey, somebody who's looking to poke holes in this thing is about to take a really critical look at this. Like, uh, am I ready for that? I mean, nobody seems to ask that question until the moment comes. They're just like, all oh, right, I don't know if I wanted them to see it that way. I mean, I like, didn't dress it up. On, on, on the flip side, we, we were working on a, on a tech deal with a double digit multiple and um, the seller actually decided, you know what, I think I want to get even more money and sell next year and didn't take into consideration this the potential tax effect uh, next year. Uh, assuming that everything is going to be all well and kosher uh, next year as far as a sell price is concerned. So I, I think having a right team, getting the right advice and having a holistic approach from all perspectives, from HR, IT, legal um, is, yeah. is definitely important. So I believe we answered this, partic this first particular question. We could jump to the next one. Um, and I'll, I'll turn to you, Tony. Um, you know, how do you see this potential rate effect in the M&A activity? So, uh, so there's two sides to the coin, but let me, let me just a quick rewind because I, I wanted to share something about, you know, on, on, off of Matt's point about not okay. being ready. Uh, yesterday, we got engaged by a frantic CEO that put his company up for sale. Uh, the company is being bought by a Japanese public company. Uh, and he said, there's, uh, next week, there's eight people from PwC are going to be in his office to do due diligence. And he feels like his uh, internal finance team is not ready for them. So we just got retained to become sort of the middleman and sort of quarterback all the information flow and, 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 and you know, bounce questions off of those guys. So just to Matt's point about, you know, yeah, I want to sell my company. I want to make a lot of money. But, you know, when you realize what, what you have to go through, you want to make sure you're ready. So wanted to make that point. Um, how, how do you see any uh, any rates uh, changes affecting the activity? So I've, I've seen both sides of it right now. We we have uh, a bunch of clients that uh, were on the fence about selling their business. And the, the easiest way to say this, they just got pushed over to the side of Let, let's get it done, let's sell, right? Um, so that's sort of one side of the fence. The other side is um, we were going to sell. Uh, but we're not willing to pay the extra 20%. And so we've been spending quite a bit of time with our clients going through some analysis and looking at some models. You know, what does it look like, you know, pre or post capital gains tax increase? Uh, and and when, once they see the numbers, they, they, some of them say, well, we're not, we're not selling. We're going to, we're going to wait. We're making money. Um, we're going to try to push our, you know, kids into the business, even though they don't want to be in the business, which is always a little dangerous uh, uh, you know, option, but um, I, I know Rob has some ideas of what to do if you're not going to sell, or if you are going to sell, what are, what, what are some of the strategies and some gifting things that he's going to talk Great. about? Well, for, but again, we're, we're seeing both sides. Follow-up question, Tommy, before you go to Rob. In the case of sure. the clients that are considering moving, I mean, not not selling and selling later, are they considering maybe doing some value enhancement? So let's say, for example, at the current rate they would have sold their business for X, whatever that number is, right? If they sell next year, right. obviously that number is going to be a little bit less. 
are they looking at, okay, well, we need to increase revenue by a certain number so we can still sell for the same amount even more? Are, are you going to that yeah. level to have those, those types of conversations? Yeah, a great question, right? So it comes down to valuation, right? So what we've been running for some of our clients, we've been running some models and saying, okay, how do we, how do we offset the additional tax, right? What kind of value do we have to get our company to? So we still net, you know, we still net net what we wanted to sell it for, right? So that's, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, point, Kyle. And, and we're doing a lot of that analysis for our clients, you know, looking at the multiples. So, you know, you, you can have a company that's selling at uh, 10 times uh, EBITDA, uh, you know, we did an analysis and they would have to sell at 13 and a half times EBITDA to still net what they were going to sell it to begin with. So definitely something to, to consider. And it's an option, right? Because if you still want to sell and, and, and hone up that you're going to pay the, the additional capital gains tax, get your value up. And there's, then obviously there's a way to do that. It's a great, that's a great suggestion, and we could probably get into that a little bit later. If anyone has any questions on that, be sure to hit it, you know, drop it in the chat. Matt, Rob, any any comments? Yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. If if you're an, if you're someone who is a, an older owner, and I don't want to, yeah, or that's got that's almost pejorative, and I don't mean to be that way. Um, yeah. If, if you're if someone someone with a with a business that is at a mature, at a mature point where they want to exit and they have yeah, and there's nobody in the family that wants to take over. Now might be the time to exit. If you were a younger entrepreneur that's building the value in your company, or it's at a stage where it can get some additional growth and acquire some additional companies, you know, look to a four to five year strategy because you know that's how long rates will probably if they change, that's how long they're going to stay changed. So plan for a longer term hold, not selling next year but selling within four or five years and plan the growth of your company accordingly, find good management, find good management to succeed to you if you're going to stay with it. Um, you know, another thing could be like Tony just mentioned, if it's going to be somebody in the family, you know, there's some unique opportunities this year because the income tax rate is supposed to go up at the end of April, but the estate tax rates are, won't supposedly change until next year. So it gives some, um, uh, time and ability to plan how to transfer value to younger generations uh, at discounted rates uh, and, and still take advantage of the $11.3 million per person estate and gift tax exemption. There's a lot of, a lot of wiggle room and a lot of play in here still. Um, so, you know, my advice is, you know, for younger entrepreneurs, stay the course, build your business. Yep. Hey, Robert, if I just, I mean, there, there are some economists that say, we, we, you know, the, the topic is not on this specifically, but it's all part of it. And I think when you're considering an exit, you have to look at all the different scenarios. Um, even though we, COVID was a big setback for a lot, individuals, businesses all across the, the map, the economy still did pretty well. There's a lot of money, there's a lot of um, finances at is you could finance deals in a pretty low interest rate. So there's money there. The economy is doing fairly well. Um, there are some economists that are saying that uh, it's just speculative, of course. Everyone has their own opinion on this, that 2026, 28, like around that time, um, they're expecting for a turn, like another potential recession, right? So do you, do, are, are you guys hearing those same conversations as well? No, no. I hear them all the time and I ignore them. Um, who the hell knows what's <laughs> going to happen? I mean, I got to plan. I, I have to live and plan for today, plan for the next month, six months, plan for the next year, and maybe plan for the next two years. I mean, you know, being scared of what something, you know, being concerned about what something is going to be in 2026. Hell, I got to live and run my business for today because that's all I got. I love, I love that answer. Sometimes you just run it. There's external factors. Hey, I'm going to just do what I can do uh, as far as uh, my particular situation is concerned and let, let, let the chips fall where they may. But I think the key thing is getting the right advice, right? Yeah, correct. And the one thing I would be concerned of, if, if I'm a business that, that is relying on certain types of commodities, I would, yeah, I would be you know, like, a, like a builder. Um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of demand for building, but, you know, is there going to be, is there going to be a down, is there going to be a downswing of customers? Because, you know, a, a friend of mine, just paid $85 for a four point four four by eight by three quarter sheet of plywood. Mm -hmm. A year ago, it probably would have been 16 bucks. 
right? Yeah. We, we do have a question here, and can maybe Rob, you confirm? Um, it was mentioned that doubling the tax rate going to effect on May first. May first, May first of twenty twenty one for the capital gains rate tax. Okay. Ordinary rates, I got to tell you, there's nothing that I've seen published about with respect to that stuff. I have no Matt. Matt may have seen something. I got yeah. I got green no, book. The green book has it back to thirty nine point six as it was. Yeah, uh, under, it's, but, it's just, was but there was there was that, that was about it. it right, Matt. I, I didn't see really yeah, anything. Yeah, else that was uh, that was the only thing they said about it. And then they, what they said was they said that capital gains would, would be pegged to ordinary rates when you hit a certain income bracket. But you have, to, you have to realize something. In addition to agreeing with Rob's stance on this in terms of what you do, my stance on it has been follow along with what the developments are. And when a draft bill makes it out of one House of Congress, then we'll talk. You know, okay, we got something that the, the House of Representatives has agreed on that goes to Senate or vice versa, Senate finances put out a bill, Senate voted on it, now the, the House is considering it. Okay, other than that, you follow along with what's happening. You have to be aware of it. You have to be strategizing your head. But in my mind, this is a personal opinion. You don't implement this stuff for clients until you've got a draft bill out because it's otherwise, you know, Rob made, made reference uh, correctly um, earlier in the program to the idea that we don't even have something to look at. Like we don't have text. And the green book, just for the record, a lot of people are probably here uh, to some extent to hear us break down the green book which is probably relatively worthwhile but i read the green book and i was like if this is a negotiating position for what they would eventually want to do like i thought trump wasn't president anymore like in terms of like taking hard negotiating positions of like this is wackadoo like the income tax provisions are not so crazy in my opinion the capital gains matching ordinary income is very much virtue signaling. That That's a very like newfangled uh, young internet term, uh, virtue signaling, right? But it's, it's. I feel like it's the Biden administration saying, oh yes, of course, we're, we're very um, enthusiastic about ta taxing the rich. But they're, they're literally just in the, in the chat panel right now, there's a gentleman who just said like, do the Democrats really have the, the majority to do this? It's like, no, they don't. Like it's the green book, <laughs> The Green Book does not resemble what a bill would look like. The other thing that I heard on the scuttlebutt, by the way, which I, I have to trust the word of the people that I, I know who are a lot closer to this process than me, is that like Senate Finance and House Ways and Means are not ready to go full bore on, on this because they don't have a proposal that's like really going to pass. Like what my, the word is that Senate Finance and House Ways and Means do not want to start mobilizing the Democratic uh, majority on this and really getting them on board until they have something that's totally workable that they can sell to the public. There's a couple things about the green book you can't sell. One of them is capital gains matching ordinary income for high earners. You can't sell that. Like it's, it's, it's insane. It, going back to Kyle's original question at the top of the program, what are capital gains, right? If you want to talk about strict definition, Rob did really well recapping it. The code actually says everything's a capital asset except for these Definitely. things that we list here. Right. Uh, Rob touched on the major categories, right? You got the inventory, stock and trade, uh, a property that's held primarily for sale in the ordinary course of a trade or business, self-created IP, whatever. Right. But capital gains, you have to realize, is from the investment of capital you already have, which unless you inherited it, it has already been taxed once. Right. Think about the way the system works. Right. Oh, I have a job that earns me income. Then I pay ordinary income taxes on my earned income. Fine. Then after that, I take my earned income, deploy it in, in the marketplace into an investment of my choosing. Whether I use it to start a business, I use it to invest in the publicly traded stock market, I buy another business, whatever, right? I'm, or I'm using already taxed money on that. That theory has flaws to it. But a lot of people, when they argue against matching capital gains and ordinary income rates, they're like, whoa, wait a second. Like, if you remember when Herman Cain, RIP to Herman Cain, but if you remember Herman Cain <laughs> running for president – he said, I'm going to cut the capital gains tax rate to zero because I already taxed that money when it was first invested. Again, the theory has flaws, but a lot of people turn around and say, I'm not ca taxing capital gains like ordinary income. They're fundamentally different. Capital gains under that theory has already been taxed once, and I'm actually reinvesting it back into the economy. That's an entire theory behind why capital gains is taxed at a lower rate than ordinary income since the dawn of the distinction in the American tax system. So like – that doesn't really have traction. And then if you want to, the, the subject of today's program is not estate and gift taxes, although as Rob has correctly pointed out, they have an inextricable connection to M&A. You have to, to address that side uh, uh, properly if you want any complete tax plan. 
But if you want to talk about what is whacked out about the Green Book proposal, it's the two pages on the estate gift and generation skipping transfer tax. It is two seismic, out of control pages that will overhaul the entire system top to bottom, and they're not doing that. So, like, the, if when it talks, when you talk about like, oh, is this bill going to pass? You have to get a bill. The rumor is from the people that I, I speak to that Senate Finance and House Ways and Means need to have something workable and realistic that they can sell to like Joe Manchin and Tom Swazi and Kirsten Cinema and, and all the people in the House and Senate that are like way too right leaning from the Democratic point of view to take all the stuff that they just proposed and like actually pass it. And interestingly, because the infrastructure, so originally this year, the, the, the idea was to have the tax bill uh, done and voted on before the end of August, before the recess, because the, 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 the government's fiscal year goes, starts on October 1st, it ain't going to happen. Uh, they can't even, the infrastructure bills move no place yet. So, you know, is this, is this something that could be voted on later in the year, maybe toward the end, include the, the tax extenders in it? Yeah, maybe. But, uh, you know, I, I agree with Matt. Don't, you know, don't get worked up about this until it happens. But an interesting point, Matt, about, uh, you know, if, if you're a student of tax history, you know, there used to be a maximum tax on, on non-wage income back before the, you, you could, they could accomplish this in, in the same way that they did it back in the late 70s, early 80s, before the, the Economic Recovery Tax Act, because you had a maximum tax on investment income where wages were taxed at a lower rate, capital gains were taxed still at a lower rate back then, but you had this maximum tax that captured the, 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 the increase for the wealthy. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a couple different ways to skin this cat rather than just using direct rate differentials. Hey, Toby, uh, Matt wasn't even born in the 80s, so I don't know if he remembers it. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's yeah, of course, I was right but there Matt, with Reagan Matt, and Tip, Tip O'Neill on Capitol Hill, you know. Uh, I was the little uh, he was, fly on he the was, wall. He was sitting, he was sitting, he was, he went, 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 when, um, went, when, um, What's his name? The guy that used to do hardball was was Tip O'Neill. Chris uh, Matthews. Chief, Chris Matthews Chris was Matthews my commencement was, speaker at my college graduation. Okay, when 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 Chris Matthews was Tip O'Neill's chief of staff, Matt was there on his knee <laughs> studying. Tax that law. was that was before I was reincarnated into into my current body. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask the the million dollar question, which probably a lot of people in this call uh, want to ask, and and I know nobody, none of us have the answer. And this, I'm going to throw this to Rob and Matt. When do you think, what's, what does your gut tell you that when this will go into effect of these, these increased capital uh, gains tax? I, I, have a, I have something in my gut, but I want to hear you guys. Um, I think 1122. If it happens, okay. it's going to be 1122. I agree. That's, and again, betting, I'll, I'll, bet, I'll bet tomorrow's other car on <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. Okay, I'll bet also. Page. I'll bet also that the capital gains rate ends up at either twenty-seven or twenty-eight percent. I agree. Uh, that's, that's, that's making predictions. That's, that's, that's the good thing is goes. recorded. You know, I like the predictions. Right, and, yeah, so and I a, predict yeah. also. I'm gonna stick my neck out there. I've done it enough. So right, it'll, it'll <laughs> be ma it'll be matched with the corporate income tax rate. That's an interesting one. That's really interesting. I like that. I had not heard that before, but I like that. So that, that that's they, you'll that's, end up making them both the same. Let's, let's talk yeah. about real life stories and obviously you can protect the innocent, right? Let, let's talk about what you're doing, how you're advising your clients like this. I know Matt, you shared some stories with your healthcare um, deals, but essentially what have you guys seen in your practice? What, what's going on? What, what, what are some of the conversations you guys have been having? If you guys are you know, willing to share. The way I'll phrase it is the storm is brewing. Um, it has not yet fully hit, but we're we're battening down the hatches. Um, we're trying to we're trying to hire people. Um, so if you know if you know any good lawyers in corporate or tax, please please uh, send them to my attention. Uh, especially tax because we're we're close to maximum capacity. But oh man, I mean this is Tony's uh, bandwidth issue that he aptly raised earlier. It's do we even have the horses for this? And there's, there's only so many hours that we can work in a day. I'll be candid about something else, by the way, because if you want to talk about protecting the innocent, I am not innocent, so I can't be protected. Um, I'll be open about the idea that the pandemic um, has been difficult for me mentally. Um, the isolation was difficult. 
Um, the increased stress was difficult. The, it, it felt like the stakes were higher than ever before, especially when I was advising on PPP. And you talk about in the early days of PPP. I think the residual stress, I still haven't recovered from it. The litigation has been high stakes. I don't even do litigation. I get dragged into litigation when it has tax aspects or when I originate it myself. And even that, touching it has been stressful. I turn my litigation partners every single day. I turn out to them, I have no idea how you do this on a daily basis. I said, number one, it's the worst system that mankind ever could have invented for resolving anything. And number two is it's just, it's, it's too crazy for words. It makes me want to throw something every time that I, I have a court appearance. But it has been very difficult. And to keep on top of that, the notion that in the event that Rob and I are correct about effective date on one one twenty two. The deluge of work that would come in in Q3 and Q4, it would be uh, insanity. It would be com it would com completely uh, off the wall. You and you'd have to be very very careful because in those moments, quality control is extremely important, and you have to be very judicious about the idea. Like I, for me, my name's on the door of the firm, and I have a direct responsibility for you know I don't want to call it because. The, the way that I only say this because everybody can relate to the way I speak about it, but I very much don't like the couch in these terms, but it's like my partners and I are responsible for feeding a certain amount of people that, that work with us. You know, and it's, I, I, it's, it's like we try to empower everybody that works in our office. So it's not like we're sitting there and saying, well, you know, it's, it's, we are the benevolent dictators who are responsible for you eating food. Like that's not really the way that we, we, we try to phrase it, but um, everybody can relate to so, the metaphor so, so of Matt, you own so Matt, a business. How, how, are you, how are you handling those conversations with those clients? You got to you got to figure out what business you're going to take and what you won't. And it's like you're very loath to turn down work, but at some point you have to pick and choose your spots. And not only that, but you have to. This is where it also pays to have a, a friendly, respectful relationship with the people who are swimming in your pool and actually nominally compete with you, right? Because um, there there is is going to come a moment if if my uh, forecast is correct, that you have so much going on in Q3 and Q4. If you have, this is what I would tell the people on this uh, broadcast who are not professionals, um, right? If you're not a professional, if you're not a professional and you're a business owner or you're somebody else who's actually seeking the professional advice, I would approach your people now if you have not approached them, right? So if you have any of these events that are going to, uh, they're on the horizon, you should like secure your spot now. You should have the conversation with folks and you should be like, listen, I'm in, right? Because if you're somebody who's going to go try and seek the advice in Q3 or Q4, you're going to get turned away from somebody. That's a near guarantee. You, you're, you're going to turn around to people who should be like, listen, I'm at max capacity. Like, and I have people that have been uh, pre, done pre-existing deals with me and have pre-existing relationships. I have to service those people. That, that, that conversation will happen. If you're a professional, um, I, I would do a real bandwidth check. And I, I would ask yourself, if, if I get a 50% increase in the work that's coming through the door, can I handle it? Because if you have a pending capital gains increase, uh, fourth quarter especially is, is going to be horrible. Um, Tony, Rob, are you guys seeing the same thing? Are you guys well, anticip gonna, anticipating the same thing as well, I should say? Yeah, I, and I'm going to do two things. I want to talk about your specific question about what are we seeing out here in, in the craziness. I'm, I'm working on a deal right now. I'm, I, I'm going to go back to my poor planning ahead of time. I mean, this, this, this gentleman is selling a self-created patent that under the new law um, is an ordinary income under the Tax, uh, uh, the tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, changed from a self-created patent by an individual from, from capital gain income to ordinary income. But there's still a specific code section dealing with patents that if you, if you meet it correctly, you can still get capital gains treatment. Had we gotten ahead of, had he come in ahead of time, we could have structured this better and got him capital gain treatment. This is where it takes, this is where you got to, where your practitioner has to know what they're doing and asking a lot of questions. We actually, we, in, in getting, in finding a lot of questions or asking a lot of questions, I found out that this guy spends most, he's an Italian citizen and he spent, or a U.S. citizen of Italian heritage and spends most of his time in Italy where he was doing his research. Well, New York State has a very interesting rule. If you spend, if you spend 450 days out of 540, of the state of New York, you're a non-resident. We so I, although I can't save him from federal income taxation, I'm saving him 100% on state income taxation because he's not he's not going to be a resident when he sells this property. He's a non-resident because of the date test. My point is, there's a lot of crazy stuff going out there. Talk to your uh, talk to your tax advisors. It's not and to go back to Matt's point, it's not going to get less crazy. It's going to get more crazy. It's just, you know, it, it's just nuts. I mean, it, you know, the last two years has been has been very difficult on me physically and mentally because of 
of our payroll protection loan practice and our employee retention uh, credit practice and with changes in tax laws, I need a break. And then we're gonna get tax law changes. Um, the one th thing is um, Doreen did ask, do you believe appreciated property gifted or inherited will be subject to capital gains tax under the new tax proposal? Perhaps, but I'm not, again, I'll bet Tony's motorcycle on it, it won't. Um, and how does this <laughs> affect our, our total trust in the state flat tax planning practices here? Because of what's proposed, I, people are doing a lot more reorganizing their family wealth transfer plans. And I really encourage anybody on this call to sit down with Matt, whoever their estate planner is, with me, with the other members of our team, to really get your family wealth transfer plan in order this year and get the stuff gold out of your name to other people. I'll give a shout out to Grassi's uh, TNE practice, by the way, uh, Lisa Raspoli, uh, Harvey and Valuation. Yep. Um, really, really good group. Um, just people I like working with, people who do good work. I mean, and uh, if you're not familiar with the group, you should get familiar with the group. Thank you, Matt. We'll, uh, we'll send you a check. Is it two hundred dollars in the back pocket on the way out? Uh, is it, is it um, uh, there's a couple other questions here about anyone using opportunity, opportunity zone programs. Yeah, I mean, look, it's uh, you know, as, as, as Francis knows, uh, hi Francis, by the way, as Francis knows, um, you know, I, 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 you know, have tried to build up expertise in that program. I've advised a lot of people on it. I think the interest in it has been pretty steady. Um, Ever since the ever since the initial crush in in you know the summer of 2018, the interest has been pretty steady. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't see people using it enough for operating businesses, and it's actually better for operating businesses than it is for real estate because real estate tends not to 100x, and operating businesses can 100x. So like, OZs are OZs are good, um, you know, and 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 if you can navigate the compliance, which is a little bit of a headache, it's good. But um, I've seen it be steady. Like people are doing it. Uh, it's a capital gains planning strategy on the way out. If you want to invest in somebody else's fund too, it's nice and simple. You don't have to do the compliance yourself. If you don't want to do your own investment, glom onto somebody else's fund. But all these funds are real estate. I mean, I haven't seen it. If anybody knows a QOF that's that's functioning like a venture capital outfit, please let me know. Uh, okay. Like I want to put my money into that, but I have, I have not seen it. I've seen all the big QOFs yeah. or real estate QOFs. So, um, you know, so it's good. Um you know, and I think you should explore it as, as one of the deferral strategies, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been steady. It's, you know, right. I see people have had uh, different reactions to it. Somebody also asked a question yeah. about uh, deal structure. That's actually yeah, our next, on, uh, should, that's actually our touch next. on some uh, deal, deal structure. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Hold it. Can, hey, before that. we go on with, the, go back to QOZs, Matt, remember that New York is just decoupled from the program. So I have an article on LinkedIn where I talked about how the drafters screwed up. Uh, they didn't really decouple. They thought they decoupled. Well, all right, yeah. All right, we'll have to talk about that because, yeah, because you know, I, I you know, it. it's – and the other, Oh, and the other thing, Rob, I remember what I was going to say. Um, the other thing that we should try and touch on if time allows is um, changing your, your domicile and the allocation rules where if you still have your operations in New York City but you're personally located out of it, those rules are nuts. Um, we, should, we should try and touch on them. Maybe we'll have the right. opportunity. Maybe so we'll that's an M&A thing let's, also. Let's, Matt, one other thing that we forgot is 1202 stock. 1202 is gorgeous. Yeah, if we, listen, it's like it's so good. There's so much good content that we could talk about. And let's, we have let's, to, let's, let's oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's, Robert let's, has let's, an easy let's, question. Are monetized installment arrangements a scam? Yes, I have an article in Bloomberg about it. Email me and I will I will send it to you. Uh, are monetized installment, they're a scam. Yes. All right, gentlemen. I mean, I'm, I'm fine saying that publicly on a recorded program. <laughs> the IRS came, just came out with the CCA. Rob, did you see that? No. The, 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 C, the, C, the IRS just came out with the CCA. It basically said, just like, get out of here with this. Um, let's, let's, talk, let's talk one second, Matt. Let's yeah. talk deal structures. Let's spend uh, you know next five minutes on that, and then we can open it up for for Q and A from everyone else, and we can talk about you know going to Port Puerto Rico or whatever you can do to <laughs> <laughs> to avoid um, <laughs> domestic taxes here. But let's talk about deal structure. Um, Tony, you want to take this one? So, are, are you talking about the? Uh... The question on the on the chat room. Yeah, well, it relates to we had planned and, and discuss it and, and and how deals are structured, right? Um, due to depending uh, tax rate changes. Well, well, like I, like I mentioned before, we, we've been doing a lot of analysis with our clients. I, I, before we before I forget, there's a great question on the chat from from Sam. Maybe we want to take that first. Yeah, well, it relates to the it relates to the the question we had planned. So yeah, let's let's take take that one. Oh, okay. 
Rob, that's uh, that's either you or Matt. I, mean, I, I think I know the, answer, the, the, the one about back. capital gains is impacted by deal structure, asset or stock yep. sales. As, asset or yeah, it, it it is of course, but but so is price. And 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 obviously sellers want to sell stock, and buyers want to sell assets because they are uh, they get a step up in basis. Where in stock you you can get a step up in basis, but regretfully. Yeah, you, know, it, it, you can make it, the buyer can make an election, but it also has an effect on the seller that you're selling assets, and it, you still get the bad answer. If I sold assets, I get, you know, it, it, I get in, uh, depreciation recapture, which is ordinary income. I get other things that aren't as attractive as just straight capital gain. That's what the stock sale. And sometimes, you know, I've, I've, I ran into this this year that was confusing to a couple clients that thought since they were selling the interests in their limited liability company. They were selling stock. Well, the bad news is when you sell interest in a limited liability company, whether it's a single member limited liability company or a multi-member limited liability tax as a partnership, that's an asset sale too. So you got to have a practice. You have to have legal, legal, legal adv- advisors and tax and, and CPA advisors that know the difference and how we can play around. And inevitably, the two most important things in any deal are reps and warranties and the purchase price allocation. And purchase price allocation affects both the buyer and the seller, and that's something you really want to negotiate the hell out of to make sure it benefits you. You know, the other thing, Rob, um, that I've been looking at in the purchase price allocation that has come up on three recent deals I've done has been the difference between corporate uh, slash entity and personal goodwill. Um, Oh, Martin ice cream, the best yep. thing on the planet. Yeah, Martin ice cream and Bross trucking, right? It's, you know, uh, uh, those two cases talk about the difference between corporate and personal goodwill. Um, and, and you have to really structure your deal carefully. But I've now seen major differentials because if you have a corporation, right, it's a corporate goodwill, assets stuck inside the corporation, personal goodwill is held by the individual, right? And there's differing tax treatment in a corporate context, depending on whether or not your your the goodwill is held by the corporation or held by the person. And you want to talk about purchase price allocation negotiations. It, it, for those of you who have never really seen that issue before, that issue started to come up more and more often. Um, and and that's an interesting thing to point out. But I mean, goodness, you could do a whole, you could do an eight-hour program on purchase price allocations. And you could do an eight-hour program on reps and warranties. Um, you could probably do an eight-hour program on tax reps and warranties alone, not to mention <laughs> whatever else is being done on the corporate side. And the corporate side is, is knock down and, and drag out. I mean, um, you know, because it's really, the reps and warranties are going to make the difference between whether or not you can go on the patio, have a margarita, and not worry about whether or not something's going to come back to bite you, or whether you're going to get a phone call out on the patio, having a margarita, about hi, is a problem. What do you mean is a problem? Now, right. So <laughs> to go back to Matthew's point, so so we were talking about a case called Martin Ice Cream. And Martin Ice Cream was very famous. It was a guy that was the haagen distributor back in the 70s or the 80s. And he wanted to sell his company. And it was a, a, a C corporation. It was a taxable corporation. And he took the position that all the goodwill with, with respect to the company was in his name because he had all the sales contacts. And people only bought these ice cream products because of him. He took that position when he sold this company. It was personal goodwill. It had zero basis, but it was tax to capital gain rates. The only thing that was sold within the company were the hard assets. The IRS argued and argued and argued, and they lost and they lost and they lost. And Martin Ice Cream has settled the law now. So if you meet certain requirements when you sell this company, you want to cut out your portion of the personal goodwill from the port purchase price of the other company's assets because it's a zero basis goodwill asset to you where the other if you're a c corporation the other sales of these assets would be run through the corporation tax twice once at the corporate level and what's at the individual level matt that was a great point to bring up all right i have one every now and again except if you ask my yeah. wife uh, so <laughs> at, any, at any rate um stock sale versus asset sale right i mean it's it's you know you can you can kind of thread the needle um if, if you have a stock purchase through a 336E or 338H10 election, and for those of you who don't know what that is, um, a lot of folks like for state law purposes want to purchase a stock because it's easier, right? If you purchase assets, there's a lot of like legal um, snow shoveling that you have to do to, you have to change over title on all the individual assets. You have to go check all the UCC stuff and you have to talk to lenders and you have to all this other stuff. Like, and you don't, you know, the asset sales, um, they're, they're really good for, for tax purposes a lot of time, but um, they're a real pain to do legally. 
So what the tax code does in recognizing that is they allow you, if you're a C corp or an S corp and you're selling your stock at the state law level, right? For state law purposes, you say, oh, we have a stock sale agreement. Great. Um, then you can make this election mutually between buyer and seller, and you can actually treat the stock purchase as an asset sale for tax purposes. Oh, now I get the best of both worlds, right? I get to have the nice and easy legal documents associated with the stock sale, right? And um, I only have to have one asset change hands. That's my stock. Uh, but I also get to uh, treat for tax purposes the entire thing as a liquidation of the corporation followed by an asset sale over to the buyer. And the buyer gets to take a stepped up basis in all the assets and, and gets to restart depreciation and gets to do all the stuff that they want to do from a tax point of view. So that's a nice little accommodation in the tax code, right? Relatively basic if you're an M&A taxation. For a lot of you on the call, you may be familiar with that. But if you're not on the call, if you're not familiar with that and you're on this call, you should, you should be at least familiar with the idea that you can do that because it gets used fairly often. And the other thing, if you're selling LLC interest um, you, and, and you're rolling over equity, uh, you can do that on a tax, tax deferred basis under Section 741. So if you roll over, if you have to keep money in the deal in the new entity, uh, you don't necessarily have to pay tax on the on, on some on, on the rolled over portion of the purchase price. The other thing, Rob, is that they got rid of technical terminations on that point. Right, right? they so did. Yeah. Roll over equity, and I'm I'm selling more than fifty percent on the on the rules before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. You have like a partnership novation, which is like crappy because when you do it as a new partnership, you have to restart all of your schedules, and you have to. You know, and it's such a pain. Like it's, you know, right. you have to, it's a new tax year now and it's like, it's terrible. So. Right. It was, the, and we thank God that was gone away. But yeah, so, TCJ I mean, got rid of it, but it, it also gives you planning opportunities too. Like, uh, you know, it's for instance, right. Um, you used to not be able to have more than 50% of a, of a partnership change hands in the middle of a 1031 or a 1033. Now you can. Um, and that opens up like really cool stuff. Then, you know, similarly, right. Um, you know, talk about for, for the, the tax heads in the room, you know, um, revenue ruling 99.5 and 99.6, you know, and trying to get creative with that stuff of a, a, an LLC that may be one member that goes to multiple members, multiple members becomes one member, you know, and there's different ways that you can structure all these different things to, to get the tax treatment you want. And, and those things are very nifty. The other things that are nifty, and I don't, I, just, I don't want to get like too, too deep into, into technical tax stuff because we're going to lose everybody. But if you are not familiar with partnership divisions, um, if you're a tax head on this call, you're not really familiar with the partnership division rules. That's uh, regulations 1.708-1D. Um, you should be familiar with those. They're super nifty. They have so many different planning applications. If you don't know them, at least you should know them. That's, that's about all I want to comment on that because the deeper we get into that, the more we're going to lose people. <laughs> yeah, Matt and I are available for cocktails if you want to continue this conversation. <laughs> you know, yeah. Tons and, of fun and, at parties. And, at and children's Tony, parties. We you are invite us for entertainment. <laughs> let's let's talk about some 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 options for 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 sellers. So you can talk about gifting. You can talk about relocating. You know, give 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 folks some some ideas. Talk about getting some family involved in the business. So what what are some tips for, for folks that, that that are looking to exit and and want to avoid pain what they do yeah o only involve qualified family members in the family business <laughs> and you put qualified in parentheses right <laughs> qualified yeah yeah right yeah, yeah. someone that knows what they're doing right right rob right. i'll tell you this what people, there's a couple things people should know on the state level one of them is that new york state in 2014 outlawed incomplete gift non-grantor trust in right. trust i don't know yeah. if people know that concept but it was a concept people used to use to avoid state income tax and the federal government sanctioned it because they didn't care. Like they sanctioned it like they allowed it because they didn't care. They got their money. So they go, oh, you want to avoid state taxes? It's all good with us. So they put out a bunch of private letter rulings approving it. It is to my knowledge, Rob, I don't know if you if you know the rules in Jersey. To my knowledge, it's still available. Jersey's in Jersey. still I'm not good. licensed I think it's there. still good in Jersey. Yeah, I'm not licensed there, but to my knowledge, it's still I'm, good I'm in pretty Jersey. certain it is. I mean, I, but it's not, funny, it's not, no I longer, you can't do it in New York anymore, right? No, you right? can't, you can't, and, and someone's going to take it to court. So I, I, I got to find somebody rich enough to do it. But the other thing, the other thing is, is I, I had that conversation yesterday with somebody about that in Jersey and, and it was with, with an attorney and, and they were doing it with respect to a, to a transaction. 
Yeah, the other thing is the relocating, right? Um, two things. One is um, a lot of people think like 183 days is sufficient to relocate like permanently. No, that's a statutory residency test. There are two tests, a statutory residency test and there's a domicile test. The New York State will still get you on domicile if you maintain what's known as a permanent place of abode here, which is not that hard to do. If you have a place that you have access, unfettered access to that you can hang your hat here, that's a permanent place of abode. So if you want to sever ties with New York, it, the safest thing to do is to sever all ties. Get rid of your house. Don't rent anything. And when you're up here, you do you do an executive stay or an extended stay, and then you're out, and then you, you, you come back, and you do an ex extended stay again. That's the safest thing you can do. If you keep a place in New York, you had better examine the domicile rules very closely and seek professional advice on that because there's two ways they can get you. There's statutory residency. That's automatic. That's a mechanical rule. 183 or more days at a permanent place of abode. There's an exception to that, about 11 out of the 12 months of the year and this and that, but you don't really need to know that uh, just as a rule of thumb. The statutory residency, it's automatic, right? Even if you, even if you don't um, have your domicile here. Your domicile is what they call your true home, right? They say this is the place where you always intend to return. And you can have that. If you spend 200 days in Florida, that doesn't mean that you're out of New York as a, as a domiciliary. They can still try and yank you back in. So, and those residency audits, okay? Those residency audits are nuts. Like if you've been through an income tax audit with New York State Department of Taxation and Finance, you know that they're crazy anyway. And they're getting crazier in my experience. But the residency audits and the sales tax audits, they're, they're crazy. They're nuts. Well, Matt, right. And also remember that the value, if you sell the, if you sell your business here, you sell the interest in your business here and you think you're going to, you know, have it, have it, have it, uh, a, um, exempt from tax because you moved from Florida, you're nuts. Absolutely. And that, that gets into the allocation rules that I touched on earlier, right? You, oh, I, I successfully changed my domicile to Florida, but my business is still operating out of New York. Let's go and say that you successfully changed your domicile. That's a big leap, but let's assume it. Now, as Rob just mentioned, you have your allocations, which, by the way, are different as to whether you're taxed as a partnership or taxed as a corporation. They're, they're, now your allocations are different, and they, they measure different things. It's a complicated system now that is, really balances itself on a knife edge. There are very, very small things that can make a very big difference. Like, what are your customers' mailing addresses? Excuse me, what? Like, why, why does that even matter? No, it matters, right, depending on what your context is. So you have to realize – that if you're selling a business interest for a New York business, you were successfully relocated to Florida, you're still going to pay taxes on most or all of it because of the way that the sourcing rules will treat that interest. There's been litigation. Rob, I don't know if you saw the Goldman Sachs litigation. There's Goldman Sachs litigation. I think that was on city taxes, if I remember correctly, and the notion of taxes to New York City on the sale of equity in a business that really they said they did, they did operate in New York City sufficiently enough to tax it there. So, you know, there's all sorts of different things that you have to be aware of about how the state and the city will allocate your receipts and your sales proceeds to certain, um, you know, to, to, to them or, or not to them. And the rules, you have to be familiar with those rules, even if you relocate, because they're still going to drag you back in to tax you. So yep. these things are, are highly important. It requires very, very intricate planning, which I know is a self-serving statement, but it's true. At the end of the day, you have to understand that, um, that, that there's very, very nuanced rules. You don't want to find out about those rules when you're under audit because there's no planning that can be done at that time. You turn around, you shrug your shoulders, and, and, and sometimes there's nothing you can do to proverbially save the patient. So these are things that, that these are multifaceted things, and this is ultimately why M&A and business succession, these are, these are things that require a team of professionals, as expensive as a proposition as that may be. It's not as expensive as what may happen to you if you don't plan at all. So you have, you have to get, you need, you need the attorney, you need the accountant, you need the, the investment banker, you need uh, insurance professionals, you need people that are in there, you need wealth managers and, and people in private wealth. You need these people to all come together because everybody has a different ingredient to add to the table to, to make this thing hum. But if you don't get the right team in place from the beginning, it's higher and higher risk that things go wrong. That's like truly expensive. That's the really expensive thing is, is, is when something goes wrong and you weren't prepared for it. Let's do this, guys. Um, you know, this is a very fascinating um, conversation. And I myself, I'm taking some notes here. I got to look up that partnership division rule and, and myself. So Robert, Matthew, Anthony, awesome conversation. I want to open it up now for folks that stuck with us. <laughs> These are probably the tax heads that stay with us for the whole hour, right? We lost, <laughs> we lost some people, but hey, um, there. I think there's some questions in the chat, so we can get to those questions first. And anyone that has any questions now, uh, if you like, you can take yourself off mute and ask 
um, the panel directly. So this is a Q and A session. It's your time to get there, get some, and they're not billing you, right? <laughs> not being billed. So you're getting some, <laughs> some some time to get get some Q and A in from our from our panel here. All right. Um, we do have a question from Rob. Are monetized installment arrangements basically a scam or capital gain through the? Yeah, I mentioned that. I have an article in Bloomberg. I'll share with people, but it's mm -hmm. a scam. It's a scam, and there's a CCA now that confirms it's a scam, and unfortunately, it's a scam. If you want to go look up on YouTube, by the way, there was one of these. I can link that to you also. I will not I, – I don't like to name – if I'm not speaking positively about a, about a company, I'm not going to name them. But there is a, a, a promoter of the um, monetized installment sale transaction that is now facing a John Doe summons, challenged it in the Ninth Circuit, and lost – and uh, oral arguments on YouTube, and it's very, very interesting. Um, you know, and these these justices are super bright people, and um, it, you know, and and you can tell that the lawyer for the promoter is climbing uphill. So I would stay far away from those. Yeah, promoters, tax tax promoters. I mean, yeah, ask the ask the KPMG partners that are in prison uh, about tax promotion. Um, you know, yes. stay away from promoters that uh, that are trying to sell you these things that sound better than they tax wise, because uh, you and they could end up in. Is cell is is cellmates. Yeah, it's very tough. I'm I'm going very through. Tough. I think we covered all the questions that came through. If anyone has any last minute questions, if not, you know, we can probably turn it back to the panel. Any final thoughts and suggestions for for owners that are that are planning on selling in the next twelve to twenty four months? You know, final thoughts, comments. While we get some Q and A, if not, we can we can wrap things up. Yeah, I get a I get a run, and I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you that uh, my thoughts. Uh, in closing, our, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate the questions. Um, if you're selling your business, please consult with some with advisors, especially if you're a closely held business. Talk to Tony or someone like him that can help get your business ready for due diligence and guide you through due diligence. Which is which is yeah, you, know, you get an LOI, it's nice, but you got to make it through due diligence, and there might be some adjustments to that purchase price determined. Yeah, based on what's in, in, in the um, uh, letter of intent and what they find in due diligence, Tony can help mitigate any of those types of adjustments if they're on the sell side. Um, you need somebody that's gonna craft a great agreement. Call Matt, he knows what he's doing. And if you wanna talk through the tax aspect, either talk to Matt and me and, and we can get you a really good economic answer. You know, as we, we talked about before, I can't, you know, there was, I can't remember what Justice said. It was attributed, I think, to Judge Justice Hand is, don't let, you know, don't let the tax tail wag, wag the economic dog. You know, look for your economic efficiencies, uh, even if you get some little tax efficiency in the deal of how much you keep in your, in your pocket at the end of the day and what you do with it. So I appreciate your time. I look forward to talking to you all soon. I hope you all have a good afternoon. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Matt, Tony, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, I, um, I put my email in chat. I'll, Tony, I'll turn it over to you real, real briefly after this, but I put my email in chat. If you want to um, reach out to me with anything you think I can help with, um, you know, even if it's a quick question, um, you know, I really don't bill for those unless it's got a crazy answer, um, which I would always tell you in advance. If you got anything that's on your mind, you want to run it by me, um, and it's within my realm of expertise or anything you think my partners would be able to help with, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you out. Uh, you stole my thunder, Matt. Same here. I'm, uh, you know, use us as a resource. You know, send us an email. Uh, you know, send a pigeon with a message, whatever you have. If you have a question about your business or, or you know, anything that you comes to mind, uh, reach out to me. My partner's here. Where we get to help. And you know, the, the clock is not running, like Matt said, unless there's a big project that uh, has to get done. But use us as a resource. Thank you, both. And um, you know. Matt, your firm, Jeffrey, you got a fabulous team there. And, and, and Lou Grassi is not, is a lot, you know, Lou's phenomenal. He's built a phenomenal company. So he's, uh, one, he's one of a kind, man. He's a force of nature. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> so I pr appreciate you both. Um, this has been a collaboration between uh, Grassi and uh, Berkman. And, um, and we at MIBB here, we just want to provide resources for our clients and colleagues and advisors that are in the process of transitioning their company, whether it be acquisition or sale. Uh, this topic on capital gains is definitely a very timely one. The recording will be available. So if you have registered, you'll get a copy of that. But thank you all once again. And Tony and Matt, appreciate your time. And Rob, who left us, appreciate thank you, you as well. And thank you all for attending and who stuck around for all of the tax shenanigans. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you for having us. Yes. Bye.